So thank you for having me. Uh, I will give you a, a quick overview of uh, where Estonia is with the e-residency program. A couple of words about myself. I'm an engineer and entrepreneur and I've been doing IT my whole life. And also I was the first uh, chief information officer for Estonian government. Today also helping Roland Geo in India. So uh, like it's a very interesting challenge for me there. But to give you a quick background, like how Estonia ended up with digital society and the residency, it always starts from the pain. So you need great pain to make the change happen. And uh, Estonia had the pain in the beginning, like when we broke apart from Soviet Union, uh, Estonia has a problem what all the North European countries have. It's the fact that we have a lot of land, the country is bigger than Netherlands or, the, or Switzerland, but we don't have people. So there in Estonia, there's only 1.3 million people living. So uh, the private sector and the public sector they both had to find a method how to govern or like how to run this country efficiently. And it was clear that like we need to push people uh, to use technology, to use IT, to use health services. The private sector was the, like I'll say, the leader and the government followed. But uh, as we all know, as all engineers who are listening to this, you know that uh, like building digital society, if you have a full political support, it's quite easy task. Like so, we just like followed followed basically a, a, a handbook uh, like how to build a digital society, and today we can say we have achieved that. And it all started like uh, like setting up uh, like basically solving the question like who is behind the device. And you have, I have to remind you, we started in in year 2000 or 1999. And uh, one of the first things was that the government decided together with private sector that, okay, let's give everybody a digital identity and uh, let's make it mandatory. So uh, all Estonians have unique identifiers, like you can see mine here on the screen, uh, the 379, et cetera. It's my unique uh, like name, it's my digital name, basically. So the the Kot Katavi, my real name, means David Eagle in English, but like there might be many David Eagles in Estonia or in Finland. Uh, we have very similar names. But this code, this 379, it's uh, completely unique. It's like Aadhaar number in India, and uh, but it's a public number. So uh, the private sector or the government, everybody can, can use it. Like whenever like they want to store any kind of information about me, like everybody can use this, uh, this, this code. So there is no security built around this uh, uh, unique identifier, but there is a, a security built around my digital identity. So this national card also has a chip on the other side. And like on top of this chip card, like there are different mobile ID and smart ID solutions and different digital identity carriers. But when we started, like you see from this graph, uh, Estonian population has been slightly declining. So from 1.4 uh, million people, we are now in 1.35, something like that. And as you see, the black line uh, year 2002, uh, the digital identity was made mandatory. Uh, so every adult, basically a person from the age of 15, had to have a digital identity. It was pushed. But as you see from the blue line, uh, the takeoff, like, like how many people actually use the card, was um, not so good at all. So this what we call CIO nightmare, like that. That like you push uh, people to use something, but uh, for many years uh, they actually don't do that. That's the reason, for example, why digital identity projects have failed in many countries until now. I mean, I think Australia has tried twice, and and both times they have rolled it back because one of the government um, like voting election cycle is four years. And if the take up, take up is not like fast enough, like uh, the next party will kill the innovation what happened before. But uh, today, I mean, in yet like 20 years later, uh, we can't imagine uh, our life without dig digital identities. Uh, so um, it has been like part of our everyday life. And basically you can do everything, literally everything online. So. I don't know. I don't even not even talk about government services, but but also the private sector and also complex services between the private sector and government. Uh, and it all relates on the decentralized uh, architecture. 
So the second problem we solved is uh, how to have an like information system where like every data source is a single source of truth. So you don't duplicate information in, in several databases on, in, or in several locations. And uh, as I said, like it's, it's full decentralized model. It means that there is no single point of failure. Uh, if one register, the registers are, are the green dots on the screen. If one registry wants to talk with another registry, they just have a point-to-point -point connection and like they will they will speak with each other. It's the same model like Skype, which as you know is also developed in Estonia historically. And uh, during those processes, uh, like you always have to solve the like privacy issues and and the worry that uh, what if there will be one system administrator who who controls it all. But I think the whole Scandinavia and North Europe has uh, have solved it quite well, basically giving a control uh, over the data to the people. So uh, yes, I'm, I know that my information is, are, is in, in different databases, but I also know who has accessed it. So for example, if uh, uh, a doctor from uh, another hospital accesses my information, uh, I see that. And if there wasn't like any clear reason why he or she accessed my data, he or she will lose the, uh, like their job, uh, or even can go to jail if, if the information is, for example, passed to the journalist or the third person. And uh, the European like way with the GDPR that also tries to give uh, power over the data to the people. I mean, it's an early stage, but it's basically copying the the Nordic model. So, uh, like what we have experienced is that people are happy to give the data away if they actually control it. So they actually see how it was used, who who was using it, and like if they don't like it, they can remove the data or delete it. So uh, so the people can they will start trusting the system, and they will start trusting this uh, in in the extent that, for example, Estonia is the only country in the world where there is a like uh, countrywide remote internet voting possible. So uh, I can be in Tokyo. Okay, now I can't at the moment because of Corona, but let's say. I have been in Tokyo and voting in in local elections. So uh, Estonians have been voting over the internet uh, since 2005, and as you see, like it's from almost 50/50 now. So uh, half of the people are voting online, and uh, half of the people are still going to the physical voting polls. And I mean, this just illustrates like if if you have proper tools in place, uh, if people trust the the solutions, like uh, they are. They are really happy to, to use it for everything. And as I said, for everything, uh, it also means that, let's say, uh, you have Digi uh, like uh, Tokusign in, in, in US, uh, which is a huge company, but uh, I still would say that like this, the crypto and uh, how I say, uh, signatures of proof is, 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 is debatable. But in Estonia, we are actually a society where um, a digital signature is preferred method. So uh, physical signature, wet signature, is less used than digital signature in all uh, legal actions all, all over the country. So, uh, but when the country becomes totally digital, what happens is that, uh, I mean, you don't have to be physically here in, anymore, right, to be part of the country. So you can run your company from distance, you can vote from distance, you can do any, uh, like, applications interaction with the banks or government or any sector uh, over the internet so the physical location is not important at all so this led me and some other people to start thinking that um, why we are only 1.3 million nation so uh, if you think about it like uh, if you want more wealth to your people if you want, want more wealth to the Estonians like, like it's the same like in, in private sector. Like if you want more revenue and profit, in most cases you have to sell more. You need more customers. So like, how can we get more customers? How can we get like, uh, how can we grow from 1.3 million to 10 million? The 10 million is because uh, the largest country in North Europe is Sweden, and Sweden uh, was back then 9.4, 9.6. So. Uh, Having ten, it's, it makes it uh, makes Estonia to be be the the leader of the North Europe. Uh, so it's a, just a marketing number. 
But uh, how to get the 10 million? Uh, so there are not too many ways how to increase the population of the of the nation. Like one way is to start doing more children. So uh, here you see three of my uh, three 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 of my children. Uh, today I have four, but back then we wrote this piece. It was was free. And uh, let, let's say this, this kind of organic growth is not for Estonia. Immigration is not also for Estonia because if you are in the same latitude as Alaska, I mean, the weather is complete crap. So nobody wants to basically, from south at least, they don't want to come here and live here. Or if you're Norway or Sweden and you give them a lo loads of social benefits, then, then obviously it might also help to, to get the immigrants. But in Estonia, uh, like immigration is very low. So we can't get 10 million from uh, immigration like we can't grow our nation like US or Germany like using immigration. So we have to come out something new. And the idea we came up was that like if we are able to serve our diaspora and like basically all Estonians all around the world digitally, and basically all the services are digital and like they don't have to be physically here in Estonia at all to be part of this society. Why don't we open up this society basically to anybody? I mean, if you want to do business in Europe, uh, you live outside of Europe, uh, you need a uh, European uh, uh, legal entity, you need a bank account, you need a VAT number. I mean, become an Estonian and, and uh, become part of our, of our digital society. So that was the plan. And that, that plan we started to execute in 2015. Um, today we are, have like uh, 71,000 uh, e-residents, that's how we call them, those, those people who, have, uh, who are using Estonia as uh, like uh, basically digital citizenship. It means that you, you, you can't travel uh, with that document or that status, but you have all the same rights like other Estonians except voting. So you can open up a company, you can run your business, uh, like you can apply for license, whatever. Uh, you are totally legal, uh, but you can't vote. So you are like a person from TC. So, uh, so we, as you see, we are far from 10 million. But if you take into account that our working population is 300, 635,000, then you see the number of e-residents with just a couple of years is more than 10% already. And we see the same with companies. They have created that. Uh, that the e-resident companies is more than 10% of the old companies in Estonia, in our ecosystem already. And when they open a company, I mean, it's obvious that they need uh, like uh, financial services, they need uh, uh, accounting, they need auditing, uh, like, so there will be a spillover. And that's what Estonia gets uh, from here, because uh, taxes still should be paid where the money, was, like, when the business was created, like or business business was provided, uh, so we are not uh, so much after the tax revenue, but we are after the the spillover revenue of of the other services. And uh, funny enough, in the beginning, we planned to create this program for people who are mostly outside of Europe uh, to give them easy access uh, to the Europe. But today, seventy percent of our revenue actually comes from inside European Union. And it's a very simple reason, because uh, uh, to create a company, for example, in Germany and run it in Germany, uh, it uh, costs you a lot. Like it costs you like thousands of uh, euros per year uh, and you have like loads of paperwork to do. On the same time, like running this in Estonia, you pay, let's say, 75 euros per month. And that's all you have to do. I mean, the rest is taken care of, like uh, it's fully automated. So, and, uh, and the typically resident, you can see from the slide, is, uh, is actually a, like a big micro entrepreneur. So these are the basic characteristics of the uh, like, um, typical average e-resident. Um, I said like uh, today, the way how they're served globally is um, that the area is not disrupted and it's totally fragmented. And uh, there are many companies who, who try to fix that. Uh, I think the leader uh, in this field, uh, not only in Estonia, but the, in the whole Europe, is Xolo. You can look it up. Uh, 
by yourself, if you're an investor, they always, I think, willing to talk with um, like how to grow, grow their business even faster. Like how we think about this, like if you think about Jews before country of Israel, uh, they were able to operate as a nation, uh, even if they, they didn't have like physical land uh, that they, they, they owned. I think uh, now uh, with the borderless countries and borderless nations, we start to think uh, in the same way that like we will see more and more like like you say virtual countries to be born uh, where people actually share their own uh, beliefs and needs and thoughts and uh, it doesn't matter where they live like today they live here tomorrow they live there and uh, Estonia tries to be like a country who gives them a platform to do that to to enjoy that kind of lifestyle and uh, most probably in the future, we won't be the richest country or most successful country who benefits from this digital, digital citizenship and, and the residence programs, but definitely we will find our own niche. And what is important is that uh, it's not about taxes. Estonia is not tax heaven. So our uh, we don't have corporate income tax, but we have dividend tax. And, and so if you pay dividends to yourself, like uh, 20%, goes off and then it depends like what is the tax treaty between between your, your country of origin and, and then Estonia. But it works and, and then it grows. Uh, it's stuck a little bit at the moment because of COVID at the moment, because uh, our procedure demands that before we issue an e-residency, we will take uh, a fingerprints because we also want to be sure that you are not a terrorist or criminal. Uh, so it's complicated at the moment, but uh, it will be fully contact-free during the next six up to nine months. So yeah, that was my keynote. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want, like, I can answer some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Davi. It's uh, 09 right now, so we have time for one single question. Our next speaker is already waiting, so let's just take the last questions that we had here in the chat it's can can one get an estonian passport via e-residency like a european union passport no uh it's not like i said it's a it's like a digital citizenship it means that it doesn't give you Estonian is part of schengen so schengen means that you can travel between countries basically without passport like so uh and we have to follow Schengen rules. So uh, it cannot be a backdoor for Europe. So uh, that answer is no. But the point is that like, uh, in a, like, if you think about COVID and if you think about the fact that you can't travel, let's say maybe many years, then, uh, and you still want to just, like run a business in Europe, uh, Estonia is, that solution is one of the best ways to do that at the moment. And that will be the future. Many countries will start to provide that. Indeed, I think Estonia is ahead by far in that and you did great. Thank you so much, Tavi.